So I hope you had a good Thanksgiving, everybody. My name is Trudy. If you're new, I'm the founding teacher here at Inside LA and very happy to see somebody here from Alaska. <laughs> I just saw that pop up in the chat. Um, yeah, and if you're here for the first time, what we do is we sit together for about a half an hour and I do some guidance, guided meditation. If you love silence, you can just, um, you know, mute it during the meditation and sit quietly with us. I mean, mute my voice. And then we have a chance for some exchange with each other, some questions and reflections. And uh, I forgot the part in the middle where I offer some teachings. <laughs> I will do that, offer some teachings before we have questions and reflections. And then uh, we end at 12.30, but at 12.40, after 10 minute break, we have breakout groups for people who would like to gather with just maybe, you know, three, four other people, have some lunch or just, just connect because that's something we, really are missing here in the pandemic. The chance to connect with each other in person, exchange hugs, member hugs, um, things like that. And so the breakout rooms are for the people, you know, and I encourage you to connect with each other and get to know each other in that way if you have time and you can plan on it because we do it pretty much every week. So, Find, uh, we'll meditate now, find a posture that you're gonna be happy enough in for the next about 30 minutes. And that posture can be sitting up. For most of us, sitting up is the way to stay awake. Um, but for some people, slow walking. You can meditate while you're walking. I recommend sitting still if you can or lying down if you have a physical, you know, a back issue or some reason why it's just better for you to lie down. And I'll ring the bell to begin. And as you sit, you can imagine that there's just a little silken thread at the top of your head, pulling your body up so that your head is reaching toward the sky. As your bottom and your feet firmly grounded on the floor and your chin just slightly tucked in. And then taking a deep breath, letting the whole body relax. <sighs> and one more breath. <sighs> Releasing any tension you notice in the body. And one more time. Completely relaxing. And we can begin by just offering the loving kindness wish. May I and all living beings experience happiness and peace. May I and all living beings be free from suffering. 
for this is why we meditate. You can tune in to the sounds of life around you and practice just listening without commenting on the sounds, just hearing. And now as you breathe, just imagining every single cell in the body refreshed. As you breathe in the aliveness of this moment. And again, just breathing out releasing, letting any tension dissolve. As you relax, and open all the senses. To just what's happening. Moment, moment by moment. And just being curious about that which is so familiar, this body, this breath, bringing a beginner's mind fresh. What is this body? Who is breathing? And just breathe in a way that feels comfortable for you.
Just feeling how the breath gently moves and whirls inside the body. And breathing out, relaxing ever deeper, relaxing completely. And as you rest the attention on the movement of the breath, the play of sensations in the body, or hearing sound, whatever comes most naturally to you, you can notice that everything, even distracting things, they don't stay. can see the breath come and go, arise, pass away. The sound appears, disappears. And thoughts, they may crowd into the mind, but they too slip away, vanish. Emotions may hang around a little bit longer. And just notice, is it pleasant or unpleasant? Just bringing awareness back to seeing and knowing how it is for you right now.
and whatever's happening, liking it, disliking. Just be still and watch how it all changes. How these feelings just appear all by themselves and they will pass away all by themselves.
aware of the impermanence of all that arises in experience, allowing this awareness to come, come as close to what's happening as possible. Just feeling the texture, the aliveness of each moment. Life in the form of this breath, this sensation, this touch, this sound. Life in the form of you. Just bringing the attention back to this awareness, this knowing, this being, this direct experience of truth, truth happening. Loving awareness observes the play, the dance of the mind, of the heart, all of the creations and emotions and loving awareness sees it all and rests centered and still. Centered and still while the world around dances, plays, spins. Just remaining 
in this aware, awake presence. Yeah, just gently stretching your body if you need to move. So this morning I wanted to speak, I want to speak with you a little bit about beginner's mind. And Sharon tells the story of she had been meditating in India for a year and somebody gave her a copy of <clears throat> Suzuki Roshi, who is the Zen teacher who founded the San Francisco Zen Center, which also includes the Green Gulch Farm and Tassajara Mountain Center. Uh, he wrote this, one of the first um, Western American books, although he's Japanese, um, on meditation called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And that book is still a classic. So somebody gave Sharon a copy of this book and she thought, oh, I've been sitting for a year. This is a beginner book. And she um, gave it away. And she tells, she tells the story laughingly because all of you, all of us who have been meditating for quite a while know that this book is as deep as we ever go. As deep as I go in my practice, I can open this book and feel met by the teaching in that book. And 
the beginner's mind is something that when you're a beginner, you don't even think about it or appreciate it. In fact, you struggle with your practice and you really are just you know, longing for meditation to help you calm down and be happier. And especially now in the days of pandemic and I'm up at Jack's still, but I heard, I know that there's a new stay home order in LA. <sighs> it's difficult to keep a beginner's mind and take a fresh look at one's surroundings when you've been home, mostly home, <laughs> you know, since March, it's been a really long time, but it's possible. It's possible to do this. And we do this when we meditate, then you know, these, there are these moments when you just come so close to experience and it's so intimate, like just noticing the texture of the breath and where you feel it in your mouth or your nose, your lungs, or where you feel it and, and just the texture of aliveness, of lived experience and feeling this, allowing ourselves, allowing ourselves to just let go of whatever is preoccupying in the moment and allowing ourselves to just deeply settle into this sense of presence and feeling intimate with what's here. This is the beginner's mind. And, you know, when, like I said, when you're a beginner, you're just struggling to stay present and not think, 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 think every minute. Uh, so you don't necessarily appreciate the openness and freshness that you're bringing to your practice, but you are. And I, I don't generally keep a journal, um, but recently I've been doing some writing and looking for anything from the past. I found, I actually kept a journal of one year of study with um, Japanese teacher, Koven Chino Otagawa. And this is a journal that was, I think from 1976. So I'd been sitting for two or three years, but uh, it was my first year of practice with this teacher. and. Reading that journal, I was so struck by uh, the freshness of the insights and the excitement that was there. And I thought, there it is, there it is, you know, the beginner's mind. If you're a beginner, you really can celebrate and realize you may not know it yourself, but it is, it is this way, things are fresh and vivid. And how do we keep that freshness and vividness? It's a question in relationship too. We get so quickly into our habits. I know what he's gonna say. I know how he's gonna finish that sentence. I interrupt him and I finish his sentences sometimes. Um, <laughs> oh God, so deadening to be like that with our experience. Uh, in in long-term relationship, you know, how do we keep that freshness? How do we keep that aliveness? How do we approach experience? It's, it's a delicate thing. It requires a kind of delicacy, uh, a sensitivity of presence. And this is what um, Jack and I were talking about this because we have actually very different training backgrounds. Uh, my husband, Jack Cornfield, trained uh, in early Buddhism. He was a monk for a few years in Thailand. He trained with different um, teachers, Theravada teachers, and learned Vipassana meditation and really deepened and stayed with that and elaborated and evolved and taught that for his whole life. And I have, and he has, of course, practiced with other teachers, but that's been his. Um, his tradition and that along with Western psychology. And he was really a pioneer of bringing those two together as well as my group in Boston, the Institute for Psychotherapy and Meditation. We worked on that too uh, from the nineties on kind of parallel East Coast, West Coast. But I also did a lot of Zen training and in Zen practice, the emphasis is on uh, simply being present and on this teaching, I think expresses it so clearly from Dogen Zenji, a 13th century uh, Zen master who started the Soto School of Zen in Japan after studying in China. He brought that back to Japan and he said to study Buddhism 
is to study the self. And Suzuki Roshi too, he said this whole study, all these philosophies and different schools and different traditions that, that became, uh, that developed in different cultures um, according to the needs of that culture. And if you are a Buddhist scholar, you study these um, conversations that unfold over the centuries, uh, these points of philosophy. And, uh, and he said, all of that, all of that is it's like a giant arrow pointing this way into your own heart. All of it directing you back into your own heart. So to study Buddhism, and you could substitute mindfulness, it's the same thing in this context, is to study the self. But not the self that is ruminating all day long, not that self. Because he goes on to say this, to study the self is to forget the self. And you've experienced it this morning. There were some moments of just serenity, of relaxation, of peacefulness, when you weren't preoccupied with something else. You were just here. That's what's forgetting the self. When we lose ourselves in an activity, you know, becoming very absorbed in writing or walking or making love or singing or whatever it might be that, you know, in whatever activity you can become absorbed in, cooking, eating, a lot of that this weekend, um, we forget the self. There's simply the activity of doing whatever we're doing. And then goes on to say, when you forget the self, you can be illumined or awakened by everything, by everything. Everything that appears in your consciousness, everything that you experience. And, and you know, I tell the story about my first teacher, De Sansanim, who used to tempt us and try to get us to practice hard and do what he called hard training, you know, sit, and go to these intensive retreats. And, and he would say, if you do hard training, soon you will get everything. And I think we all assumed, we all assumed he meant everything good, everything that would come our way, bliss, clarity, non-thought, we'd get everything. Um, but after practicing for two years, three years, four years, you start to realize, oh, this little cushion I sit on, my K-box afu, or this chair that I sit on, wherever you sit, um, that you turn to for comfort. It's also the place where you meet all your demons, don't you? I meet mine, all my past traumas, all my, it just surfaces. And this is what he meant by you get everything. And it's okay if we aren't trying for only what we like, only the bliss, clarity, not thought that can arise in meditation, then actually everything is what we call a Dharma door, a gateway to the truth. When I was guiding the meditation a little bit this morning, I said, you know, this is this knowing, this is the direct experience of truth. This this loving awareness that knows, that can see the arising and the passing away of experience, that knows impermanence, that knows what's happening right now, that notices and knows that, oh, I'm thirsty. That's what I mean by the truth. And the truth is ever more elusive these days. Uh, as we all know, and for the reasons that we've talked about here before, and I'm sure we'll continue to do. And it feels to me even more that there's even more of a craving. Um, and craving actually has negative connotations, a longing, a yearning for authentic, what's real, what's true. And even though meditation or being with the breath or even doing loving kindness practice, it, it can't erase all of the sorrow, all of the grief, all of the despair, all of the 
anger or fear, whatever may be happening in you or around you, or we look at the planet, the environment, we look at what's been happening in our country. It's not like meditation is going to dissolve or erase all of that. Um, it isn't going to, but what else do we have? In, these, in meditation, we have a chance to touch to that intimate experience of presence. And often, those of you who've been coming to this group for a while or meditating with me for a while, you know that I give this instruction often to just step back and receive the moment, receive the breath. Um, that too comes from a teaching uh, from Zen Master Dogen where he teaches that when we approach experience with our agendas and our ideas and how, if I do this, I'll get turned on. If I do that, I mean, just all our ideas about things and how they're supposed to go. Um, when we do that, that's delusion. It's also suffering. Um, I have a friend in Boston. Um, he's a master of a martial art and lives an extremely structured life, uh, gets up at the same time every day, goes down to his cellar and practices for the same number of hours every day, gets up, goes to his job every day, very, very structured life. And there's a beauty to that kind of repetition. It has power. Um, this is uh, one of Suzuki Roshi's students says, I used to think of Suzuki Roshi's life as a mantra. In other words, a phrase that you would repeat. Um, we tend to think of a mantra, and he defines it, as a phrase that we repeat over and over. But when I observed Suzuki Roshi, it seemed to me that the way he lived his life, including all the variations, was like a mantra. Every day at the old Sokoji Temple on Bush Street, which became the San Francisco Zen Center later, I would watch him enter the Zendo from his office, offer incense, sit Zazen, officiate the service, the chanting, bow to each student as they left. Day after day, he did the same thing, which was amazing to me. I had never seen anyone perform that kind of activity before. His life seemed to be completely devoted to everything he did with a complete, simple, concentrated, unself-consciousness. That's what is meant by no self, anatta, forgetting the self. Why, when there are so many seemingly important things to do in this world, was this small robed priest doing this simple, seemingly useless activity day in and day out. I never thought of myself doing anything like that, such a disciplined way of life, but somehow it was not a repetition. And you may think you're doing all different kinds of things in your life and this doesn't apply to you, but you're breathing, right? Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. We repeat certain activities, we eat, we digest, we go to the bathroom, we, we repeat many things. But somehow it was not just repetition. It was a dynamic that was always illuminating his surroundings and an expression of his practice. That is one reason why he had so much spiritual power. So my friend who lived this very structured life, one time, <clears throat> We all drove across the country together. It's a long time ago, in the 70s. And uh, we had no idea how far we would go each day. We were camping. We didn't really know where we would camp that night. It drove him nuts. He was so grumpy the whole trip. And this comes to another, <laughs> this is where, yes, structure, discipline, repetition. This is a really important part of our practice, especially during the pandemic, because we've all developed habits, right? During this pandemic, but what kind of habits are they? And uh, can we develop the habit of giving our full, complete, intimate attention to whatever we're doing? And 
this friend who got so discombobulated when he didn't know what was going to happen, you know, this is also part of us right now. We don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic and other things that are happening in the world. And so how can we be comfortable with that too, with the not knowing? And can we bring that not knowing, that beginner's mind, I don't know, I've never done this before, or I'm new at this, so I don't really know the territory. Can we bring that to the things that we do repeatedly and to the discipline that we have? Discipline has a funny connotation, that word, but I like this definition of it, the courage to follow what we love. Disciple, right? Somebody who follows the root of the word, the courage to follow what we love. And can we bring that, when we're bringing that discipline of hopefully we love being present, hopefully we're learning to love life in the form of this being. And can we set aside those times to just appreciate this being? in one form or another? Um, and can we bring that beginners fresh, alive? I don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe we've done this hundreds of times before, but can we actually slow into an experience, whatever it may be, and do it a little more mindfully, a little more curiously, <laughs> interestedly, like we maybe don't know what's going to happen next, because in fact, we actually don't. A good time to practice this is also, um, I love twilight. I don't see that well. My eyes have issues. I had botched LASIK years ago. So anyway, I, but I, I was nearsighted beforehand. So twilight has been a time when I can't see as well. But it's also a time when nobody can see as well just to go out at twilight and experiment with walking as the light goes. If you can walk in a park or some, you know, the trails are still open, I know, and the beaches. Just walking someplace where maybe you can't see exactly your next footstep. And how is it? What is that like? Uh, there's a full moon tonight, but if you get up between one and three, you'll get to see the eclipse one and three this morning, the lunar eclipse when the moon slips into the shadow of the earth. And that might be a good time to go out and walk. Um, just to be willing to approach these things that we do again and again with the openness of mind and heart. Just pretending Sometimes pretending, oh, what if this was the last day that I had to live and be alive in this form on this earth? And, and I truly don't know where I'm going afterwards, but what if this was the very last day? Like, how would I be? I would appreciate every sip of water. I would appreciate every sound. I think it would be a beginner's mind very awake, fresh and alive. So this is what I want to express and share with you this morning. Um, it doesn't even feel like teaching, it feels like sharing an experience that we are here together, that we're here during this, well, briefer and briefer time. And that given that this is who we are, where we are, and how fleeting actually this life is, it doesn't make sense to miss it. It doesn't make sense not to be here for it. And when we are here for it in this way, when we are awake and alive and here like this, it's there's love in that. There's love. It's like you can't help but love it. Um, and maybe we don't, you know, I can't say I love my depressed moments or something like that, but 
I can be in them. And uh, one person that I worked with said to me, and they had struggled with deep depression. And they said to me, depression was actually my most, I've had other teachers, but it was my most powerful teacher. Because with depression, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go anywhere. All I, I was, it was like forced into only this moment. And when I stopped turning away from it, they said, when I stopped turning away from it, because there was really no escape, it followed everywhere, you know, it was just a, a veil over everything and turned toward it. I discovered things. I discovered there was actually some movement there. There was actually like some little tendrils of aliveness. Like I was telling you about my friend who walked, snuck into the park in Point Reyes where there was the Woodward fire. It's not open. They're working hard to get fallen trees and you know dangerous stuff out of the way. But this friend did sneak in and uh, hiked around and took photographs. And you can see ash, just everything covered with ash, everything dead and burned, and already ferns, lots of green ferns, you know, sprouting. And this is what I think this person was describing, discovering in the midst of their gray ashen experience of depression um, when they were willing to turn toward it. And this is what, um, yeah, this is the goodness of our being that I want to share with you because it doesn't depend on what kind of person we are. Uh, in Zen, there's a saying, even a demon can be, <laughs> is purified in Zazen. Like, it doesn't matter what kind of person you are, just being with yourself and being willing to know yourself and to see the impermanence, the suffering, the forgetting of the self that happens when we settle into the freshness, the aliveness, the intimacy of just being here, alone and together. So... May we create these moments. May our mindfulness practice serve to create these moments with ourselves and each other as often as we can. You know, this is our way of loving life, of dancing with life, making love with our aliveness. So, what I want to share with you this morning. And now we have a chance for some questions about your practice. No question is too basic um, to ask. You're always helping somebody else when you ask or reflections from your practice. And Austin is moderating today. Thank you, Austin. And if you uh, go into the participant down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, go into participant, and you will see, uh, oh, I don't have it because I'm a host, but you will see the raise hand function in there. And then Austin will call on you and you can mute yourself and we can talk together. Thank you for that, Trudy. That was beautiful. And I just can't help but think how lucky we are to have you, how lucky the world is to have you. So let's go ahead and start with uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Hi, Trudy. Hi, Jeff. Wait, I want to put you on speaker so I can see you better. Can you see me? I mean, I can see your little square. Yeah, now I can see you. Okay, now I can really see you. Um. I'm trying to, I was really very moved by what you said today. Um, and I'm just trying to, what does, uh, I forget the exact words you use, but 
um, sort of being with your depression, I think is the words you used, rather than, you know, moving, trying to move away from it. What does that look like? I, I am having a hard time with sort of the practical <laughs> or the process. Yeah, exactly what, yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, it's a really great question. And it also brings me to another point that Jack and I were talking about in that conversation that I mentioned, where I was trying to explain to him that the way I experience things when I'm really present is very non-conceptual. And, you know, and he has the ability to be very conceptual, but also very present. And we were, it's a result of different training and also just different people and the way we perceive things. But he was reminding me that he went to teach at the Zen Center that I mentioned once. And the Zen teacher introduced him by saying, now Jack Cornfield is going to, and this is relevant to what you just asked me. Now Jack Cornfield is going to explain to you what you've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, but we never told you anything. <laughs> we never told you anything about it, about how to do it or anything. So thank you for your question. And what I mean by turning toward depression, does it's different from wallowing in depression. We all know how to wallow. Um, it's, you know, put on the wallowing music and it's different from that. Um, it's actually looking right into that lived felt experience of being depressed, like the, the heaviness in the body, you know, the lethargy in the body, the helpless, hopeless, cast to the mind, you know, that, that, that sort of, that sh sort of covers everything with won't work. And then depression has different flavors. There are angry depressions where everything is just so irritating and there's anxious depressions, everything's frightening. Um, and there's sad, and you know, that's what we think of usually by depression, like depressed, melancholy depression where everything is um, depressing. So whatever the flavor is, you would notice that, you would see, and sometimes it'll change, right? And you start to get curious about the changes in the flavors uh, of the depression. Like what is, you know, you bring that sense of intimate exploration. I mean, I, the analogy would be like if you're exploring something you're really interested in. I don't know, like, this must be how I don't explore caves, how somebody must feel when they go into a cave, you know, or anything that you're really interested in. For me, it would be like going underwater, um, either diving or snorkeling or looking into that world, mm -hmm. really interested in what's there, including the bleached out coral that's dying, you know, not just the pretty fish. So with depression, you're looking at the bleached out coral that's dying, you know, you're looking at what ever the contents are of your experience in that moment. And it might be, you know, angry thoughts or just hopeless thoughts. It might be just awful feelings in the body, but you're having the courage to look at it. And that willingness to know it and to get intimate with it, which is the last thing you wanna do because it's so mm -hmm. painful and unpleasant. It's really counterintuitive, but that's what I'm talking about because that's, and it takes, it, it takes, it takes effort and it takes company. It takes somebody like me saying to you, trust me, do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to make things worse. I promise you it's not going to make things worse and it could make things better. The worst is that nothing will happen at all, but it could make things better. And the other thing I would say to you, Jeff, which uh, I learned this from a psychiatrist friend of mine, actually Dan Siegel, he will not work with people who are suffering from depression unless they commit to 45 minutes of aerobic activity every single day. Mm -hmm. That's how important he feels it is to the brain to get that um, blood flow. So I'm just sharing that too. I've probably told you that before. Thank but, you. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the instinct, of course, is to, is to try to get the hell away from the depression exactly and, uh, exactly just won't will it wish it away but um i i think the but, curiosity i like the concept of the curiosity and really kind of 
studying it and um and and I do an hour or more of of cardio a day for the very reason you said fantastic it. that is the most transformative I thing I do all day other than meditate fantastic and you know when you're getting curious um it's like depression is your monastery right now. Mm -hmm. That's where you're practicing. Mm -hmm. So you could get curious about all the parts of you that inhabit that, you know, that monastery. People don't live alone in the monastery. <laughs> They're in community, mm -hmm. you know, and you're, you're in community too with the beings inside your heart. And the assumption and is you're going to learn, you're going to learn stuff about, why or, or 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 you're just about it, yourself it, why doesn't even matter here what's going to happen is that the energy of investigation they call it in the ancient texts it's a factor of awakening it's an element of enlightenment that curiosity that interest because it brings us close to experience and so what happens is you're activating uh this factor of awakening and you start to discover more aliveness in experiences that felt dead before. It's really different from just, you're not really interested in why you're depressed. Mm. If you're depressed, you're miserable and you just wanna, you know, <laughs> why it doesn't actually matter. It matters in therapy, but not in meditation. <laughs> you know, you go to therapy to figure out why, or yes. not to figure out, to, you know, to learn. But in meditation, what matters is this willingness to come close to experience the awareness, the knowing, and the curiosity that will lead you into that, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. It does. And I'm going to uh, explore that for sure. Good luck. Let me know how it goes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So yeah. next we have a question from um, Rick in the chat. So he says, Trudy, it's fascinating that we're asked during meditation to experience all of our senses while our eyes are closed. How are we being encouraged to experience sight under such circumstances? And does your twilight experience somehow play into this? That's interesting. I don't know. I'm thinking about that, Rick. Uh, You know, opening the senses is an invitation to presence because it, it's not like you have to actually focus on what you see when your eyes are closed. I mean, you can see stuff when your eyes are closed, like my eyes are closed. I see something that looks like a Rothko painting, um, but not as vivid colors. You can see things with your eyes closed, but that's not, <laughs> that's, that's a very concrete, literal understanding really what it is is pointing to the fact that we don't hear sounds from yesterday we don't hear tomorrow's sounds i only hear the sound that's happening right now and 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 actually sight when my eyes are open um when i'm present like this and undistracted then i just see what's happening like i could see austin blinking but now he's not blinking, but I, yeah, I could see him blinking and smiling. And I, I, I won't see Austin's blinks of yesterday, they're gone. I won't see Austin's blinks of tomorrow, they haven't happened yet. So it's an invitation to just stay here. And again, people will ask, well, I'm planning and uh, yes, just know you're planning. You're here planning, you know, it's, it's like that. So I think your question about twilight, um, I think what twilight helps me with, Rick, and it would maybe, you know, you just try it out and see, every, we're all wired differently, but uh, those of us who can see, who have vision, most of our consciousness is going out our eyes all day long, out, out, looking at, things that we perceive as out there, separate from us, objects out there. And when we take that backward step and pull our vision in to receive, it's more like, you can do it right now. You can just experiment, everybody, you can just experiment. Like instead of looking out at something, just let your vision kind of be more panoramic 
So you're taking in like the whole room, you're taking in like the whole sort of periphery of your visual field, but you're not focusing on any one thing. Um, I feel like that's what twilight helps with. It's, and then that can expand into a sense of space around you. And after all, it's very vast, you know, when you're really open in those moments of stillness and presence, and it gets very big and awareness gets very big and consciousness gets very alive to where we actually are, we understand consciousness isn't something in here or in here. We're inside it. Consciousness is, is everywhere of, you know, we're, anyway, that's how I understand uh, Twilight. Great, Sherry has been patiently waiting. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Sherry. Hi, Trudy. Hi, everyone. I'm here from um, Staten Island, New York City. Um, oh, welcome. Um, Trudy, you were, so this is, you know, total beginner's question, and you were speaking to Great. that. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that feeling of, you know, when you were speaking during our meditation, you know, and the minute you said, um, um, they don't stay. I immediately felt the feelings of um, you know, that grief, that loss um, of impermanence. And, and I find that meditation um, helps me with that. It, it kind of, it's like a safe container where I can come and then I can be with that and allow that to surface. So I'll often cry. And when you got to that point in your talk, that's when I started to cry. Yeah. Um, that things will vanish, all things will pass, all things will end, you know, my, my, my friends, my family, you know, my husband, myself, my son, you know, it all, but I, um, so I'm becoming a little bit more comfortable with that arising, that awareness in meditation, but the present moment, right, the um, awakening into that, and then you use the word receiving that, that's where I, right? I want to run, I want to pull away, you know, I do lean more on the depressive side. So maybe that's why I'm more comfortable with yeah. the, the loss and the grief. And so, um, yeah, I, that's where I struggle, you know, with, 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 you know, the rest of what's there, you know, where is the oh, receiving of the present moment to really fully inhabit that? How do I, you know, get that. Yeah. Sometimes, Sherry, you receive what you're receiving. It's like I said, you know, it's not always pleasant. You're not always liking it. And so sometimes receiving the moment might mean going, <gasps> breathing into grief or breathing into what you call depression or, you know, it might just be receive. It's receiving what's here. And when that willingness to receive experience is paired with the understanding of impermanence, it's so much easier to bear. Because part of the reason we get in such a tangle with our emotions is that in the moment we don't see, you know, it, it, you're completely identified with it. You don't see out of it. You, you don't have an awareness of it. You're in it and you don't know that it's not gonna last forever. You know, you don't know that, I don't know that I'm not gonna like, I don't know, hate my husband forever. I do know that because I adore him. But I'm just, just an example. You know, you don't know that you'll be depressed. You feel like you could, it could last forever or, or it could be so big that it could engulf us and destroy us somehow. It's another fear of emotion. But, but that's where the teachings, you know, we, we pair our felt experience, the lived experience, which is the truest, most real, direct knowing of the truth with also the understandings that we get from the teachings about impermanence. And, you know, impermanence is a great comfort when you're in grief, you know, it, it's less of a comfort when you're all cozy and loving your family and <laughs> wanting it to last forever, right? So I think that um, just 
don't go for the most traumatic thing. You know, don't start with the biggest grief that you have. Just experiment with letting in smaller unpleasantnesses or things you don't like. And, and you can make a light mental note. You can just say, disliking, disliking. Um, I like to say liking or disliking rather than pleasant or unpleasant for the simple reason that pleasant or unpleasant kind of puts it out there. But really, the reaction is happening in here. You know, the thing itself might be perfectly neutral to somebody else. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, an and interaction that pushes your buttons might not bother me at all. So liking or disliking is feels more intimate than unpleasant, unpleasant, or pleasant. But I would experiment with making that note because it helps you notice. And that, that noticing is what keeps you from, keeps all of us from, that's mindfulness that keeps us from being completely caught. I am so grateful to my teachers. I am so grateful to all the humans who have found ways to um, be free to be liberated from that, uh, being encapsulated in our thought world. I feel so much love and gratitude um, for that. Not, you know, all the traditions and all the paths. And for those of us, you know, in my generation, I'm grateful for the people who discovered the psychedelics. I mean, you know, there's many paths or doorways into uh, awareness. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm glad you're here from Staten Island. <laughs> yeah. It's great. So see we have other uh, people. Yeah, we have one one question from the chat and then um, Laura, Melvin, and then Jewel, if we have time. Um, the question from the chat is back to the earlier discussion about depression. Would there be certain situations where it's not advisable for people to look deeply into their depression? There may be, yes, I think there may be, it really depends. And um, it's a good question because it really, what it's really raising is the possibility that sometimes meditation may, might be contraindicated. It might not be the best thing to do. Uh, and I know certainly if you have trauma in your background, you know, you've been in combat or you've um, you know, been a medic or you've been in a war, or if you've had, you know, been the victim of a violent crime or an assault or even childhood abuse, um, if it's fresh trauma, freshly discovered trauma, um, and trauma is always fresh in the flashback, it's always happening again, very vividly, then you have to practice differently you have to meditate, not closing the eyes, not going inside, but just resting in reminding yourself, this is here, this is now, my feet are on this floor, I'm safe right now. You know, there's different practices that you do. And there's a book, um, Trauma-Informed Mindfulness by David Trelevin, that is good. And I would recommend looking at that book. Um, as for just, you know, being sucked in deep to depression, I don't know, you could try and see, try and see. Um, and if you're that sucked in, if somebody is that sucked into a deep depression, I'm hoping you have some therapy. Um, because that's something that you could explore with the um, therapist who's supporting you. I think we have one more person and then, then our time is gone. Wow, talk about impermanence, that went fast. All right, I think uh, Laura was next, if you'd like to unmute. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Trudy. It's just a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and Thank all you. Of you. Thank today. you for being here. Yeah. Really nice. Yeah. Um, I, my question first came up, uh, the question that, I don't know, kind of bubbled up. Um, 
the discussion about closing your eyes during meditation or leaving them open, um, I found, well, I'm, I'm curious about the eye. And so I've been doing some studies about how the eye works and how the rods and cones uh, stimulate different things in our brain and our body, you know, and cause us to react and respond to our environment in different ways. And so I thought, you know, I've done that twilight meditation, whether it's dawn or evening, and have had very different experiences because of the amount of light. And um, closing my eyes is the one way that I can immediately tune out <laughs> so much monkey talk in my head. It's just amazing. Like, wait, my eyes are open. My, my monkey brain is going. And it just chatters, chatters, chatters. I close my eyes and all of a sudden the chatter stops long enough for me to hear the quiet. And of course the chatter might start again. But anyway, it helps me to refocus. And I learned through some pretty traumatic experiences um, that there are some things that uh, I had to do. I couldn't just, I, I've been, I've been through some trauma. And so I dealt with um, some PTSD for a while. And one of the best things that I learned how to do, and it, I had a teacher um, was um, that neural, that tapping, you know, where you tap your body yes, tapping. Yes. That I is do just, know. it is absolutely it's so helpful. So helpful because our mind is not just that stuff that's between our head or in our ears. It's our whole body. And when you have somebody that can help you understand what tapping can do, what breathing can do, exercise is super important. Um, the whole, the whole, the whole package. So it's, it's not just you know, looking at what hurts or what grief, what your grief is, it's looking at your whole body. It's everything. It's it's a much bigger picture. And what I just tickled pink to be able to do is to find a group of people who spend the time in a group and share the time nice. together because the energy is just awesome. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. You know, you probably know about this because you've been studying eyes and light and perception, but um, in the Tibetan tradition, they have retreats that are called dark retreats where people go into a specially constructed, um, you know, hut or where no light can come in whatsoever. And then, you know, meals are slid in through a special, you know, like a cat door or something. <laughs> um, yeah. for that person and they stay in the dark and discover the light of the mind and it's really really something I've never done and still hope to do in this life so thank you thank, thank you Laura so let's just sit together for uh, a minute we have a minute <clears throat> Trudy would you mind just repeating the trauma book reference again please that you were uh, talking yeah, about? Yeah, it's Trauma Informed Mindfulness. Thank you. By David T R E L E A V E N. Yeah. And you know, I was just, I mean, people can have trauma from so many things, from being alone in a pandemic if they're isolated, you know, for all these months or from being in an abusive relationship of any kind. I mean, I just feel like we need to be very tender, very tender with ourselves. And yes, the mindful way through depression um, is also a wonderful book by colleagues of John Kabat-Zinn, um, Zindel Siegel and, and company. So let's sit together for a moment.
So at the end of a period of practice and listening to teachings, which we call study and sharing together, we appreciate the opportunity to do this, to free our hearts, to open our minds and to support each other in developing wisdom and insight and compassion. We appreciate just this peacefulness of settling ourselves together. And so how we express our appreciation is through sending this loving wish. May all beings everywhere without exception partake of the goodness of loving awareness, of mindfulness, of presence, of being. And may all beings experience happiness and peace. So I want to invite everybody to unmute yourselves. You can say hi and goodbye and so happy to see you all and be together. Um, next week, I am actually leading a retreat, which oh, I should have put it in the chat. Um, we'll send it out to you. Uh, I'm teaching a retreat with Sharon Salzberg and Thomas Davis uh, from Inside LA. And it's a retreat that is sponsored by uh, a man named Jason Garner, who started a project called Love for Life of offering Dharma, of offering meditation uh, classes and talks to people who are stuck at home uh, out of work from the live music industry. Mm -hmm. And actually mm -hmm. this retreat is open to everybody. It's a three day online retreat with a very gentle schedule, which you can expand to be more, um, a little more rigorous if you want to. Uh, we'll give a suggested schedule for that, but it's a very gentle retreat. And uh, it's not on the Inside LA website because actually we'll put it on the website because I'm teaching in it. We could put it on the website, I think. Um, but it's, uh, December 4th, 5th, and 6th. And so I won't be teaching next Sunday, but I will be teaching in that retreat. And for those of you who haven't sat, uh, haven't gone to a residential retreat and done intensive practice that way, a home retreat is a very gentle way to um, sort of extend your practice, to experiment and explore with what happens if I do a little more. And so I want to encourage you to, to try it and to come and join. And, and I offer a bow to Jason because he offered the classes just freely for everybody and they're going to exist online. And, um, and he, uh, you know, and he covered all the expenses for whatever people he invited and so forth. So maybe I will see some of you there uh, next weekend and everybody else. I will see you in two weeks. So please take good care of yourselves. Be gentle. Um, keep your beginner's mind even as the pandemic drags on. Um, and thank you. Thank you for your practice. Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank great, you. great class. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and stay for the great breakout safe. groups. Feel free to stay and yeah. um, you visit with people in the breakout groups. And I guess, oh, Austin, you have announcements. Sorry, we've gone a bit over time, everybody. I'm sorry for that. No problem. I'll just paste a few upcoming events. Okay. Um, thank you, Austin. Will, if I, will, someone yeah, else, and, will someone else be teaching this week? Yes. Do I know who yet? Not quite, but mm -hmm. it'll be a good person. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Come and support them. They'll be good. Okay. You know, it'll be one of our, one of our good Inside LA teachers. <laughs> okay, so I will see you in two weeks and I promise we will send the information about the retreat um, to everybody who's here today. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Trudy, and everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.